My name is Krishna Rao. I'm an infectious diseases physician and scientist at the University of Michigan. Um, I spend most of my time both clinically and in my research program studying healthcare associated infections, but in particular C. difficile infection. And that's the drive of what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today. C. difficile, and I'm going to just call it C. difficile to avoid the whole Clostridium versus Clostridioides debate that uh, some of you may uh, uh, know about. Um, I think the interesting thing about this uh, gram-positive, spore-forming uh, uh, bacillus is that it's kind of everywhere. So, you know, here in the slide I have a picture of what it looks like on a gram stain, and that's a healthcare worker's hands uh, that were uh, pressed onto a, a auger plate. But, uh, you know, I have colleagues in Houston that have gone out to parks and gone to the grocery stores there, gone to people's houses. And whether you're talking about park benches or people's houses or the produce aisle or the red meat that you buy at your grocery store, spores of C. difficile are in all of these environments. And they're in about a third of the park benches and about half of the organic produce at their local grocery stores. So it's one of those organisms that um, by itself doesn't cause disease and that we're coming into contact with all the time in our daily lives in many situations. So it is healthcare associated though. So what, what makes it healthcare associated? And the reason we uh, assign that term to it is because there is a uh, period where people are susceptible. And what makes people susceptible often is antibiotic exposure. So this is one of those uh, situations where it's the host and the microbe that interact to cause the disease. And you have to have both pieces in order for the disease to occur. And in the case of C. difficile, the host isn't necessarily the most important factor. It is. People who are immunocompromised, for example, are more likely to, to develop C. difficile. But the microbiome in the gut, I think, is the, the most important factor that we've now determined in disease initiation and susceptibility. And what happens with the pathogenesis is you have a healthy host. So up here is depicted a nice, diverse, healthy gut microbiome uh, and community. And then something happens to disrupt that. And usually that something is uh, what we term dysbiosis uh, or loss of colonization resistance uh, and from antibiotics most, most typically. During that state, if you're exposed to C. difficile spores, um, which again are kind of everywhere, but admittedly often more so in healthcare settings, uh, that's when disease initiation can happen. Spores germinate, uh, produce toxin, uh, the toxin uh, uh, causes the disease. And some people, will actually expire and die from this infection. It can be very severe. Others will go on to be treated and recover. But notice I have that person colored in yellow, not in green, because they're not out of the woods yet. It can be a very severe course during that recovery. Some people end up in the ICU or even need to have a colectomy or at least a partial colectomy to get through the infection. But even those that recover are often susceptible to having a recurrence. In fact, one in five on average uh, will recur even after their initial recovery. So despite knowing all of this, um, you know, we uh, are seeing actually an increase over the last two decades in C. difficile infection, stabilized now, but it's still quite prevalent. So data from just a few years ago suggests anywhere between 300 and 500,000 Americans every year get this infection. Um, many of them will have a recurrence. Um, there's about 35,000 deaths a year, too, from this infection. Older adults are disproportionately affected by this, and, and a particularly vulnerable population. When they get sick, they often have to be admitted to the hospital. So this is a big driver of healthcare utilization and cost. So despite knowing all that, there's some gaps in our knowledge. So we don't know why certain patients experience complicated or recurrent disease. I think that's insufficiently understood. Largely because the clinical risk factors don't help us as much. If you think about it, who are the people that get um, recurrences and uh, have more severe courses? It's older adults, people who have uh, immunocompromising conditions or other comorbid diseases. Um, People have implicated ongoing antimicrobial exposure. Um, but those are also the same uh, factors that led to them getting C. difficile in the first place. So it doesn't really help us differentiate who's going to head down a uh, course towards recovery versus experience these adverse outcomes. Um, the other gap is, well, OK, great. But in other um, conditions and other diseases, we've developed predictive models and clinical prediction tools to help us. These don't really exist for C. difficile. Um, and in other diseases, people have studied biomarkers, but we don't know if biomarkers can be helpful in this setting. Um, so turning to clinical data, uh, they only get you so far. You might say, okay, well, a lot of the studies that have tried to predict uh, who's going to go down uh, an adverse pathway after C. difficile infection, 
Um, they were done in single center, small cohorts. So we said, okay, well, let's try to validate at our large cohort. And sure enough, on the left, you see this is an ROC curve. And um, without explaining too much about the curve, you want it to be more round and up to the upper left uh, to show higher accuracy. And the closer it is to that diagonal, the lower the accuracy it is. And it's only about 70% accurate at predicting who's going to have a severe episode of C. difficile. Um, and we do better when we combine our data and use a large cohort. So on the right, we took a data set that was geographically distributed across the Midwest with over 3,000 patients. We used best practices and machine learning um, with uh, testing and training sets. So this is on the holdout uh, data set. And we do quite a bit better, but we're still only about 80 to 90% accurate at the most, mostly 80% depending on the site. So better, but we can do a lot better than that. Um, and, and so far, Clinical data hasn't been um, the best way to do this. So what about biomarkers? And I, th and I think biomarkers do show promise. Um, so on the left, we have um, a, a ROC curve for a study where we took um, a 17-plex panel of inflammatory mediators. And these were measured from the sera at the time of diagnosis in patients. And then we followed them to see what their course of disease was. And we were 80 to 90% accurate with just five uh, inflammatory mediators um, and no clinical data, this is irrespective of the clinical data, in predicting who was gonna have an adverse outcome. Uh, with biomarker data, we got so far, um, but with microbiome data, we were actually quite a bit more successful. So on the right, we have um, an a ROC curve from a model, and this one integrates clinical factors as well as microbiological factors in the microbiome to derive a model that was 94% uh, accurate in predicting 90-day recurrence within subjects, measured at the time of diagnosis using just a stool sample. So uh, this is all to say that um, this, this research need is uh, in the progress, a process of being met, but we're a few uh, years away, I think, from having an app for um, uh, predicting who's going to go down these pathways when you see your patients. Um, but I think um, both clinically and research-wise, there are benefits if we do have good, accurate algorithms that can predict these outcomes. Clinically, obviously, we can help adjudicate therapies. There are some treatments that are um, invasive, such as surgery, but can be life-saving. We want to do that only in the right patient at the right time. Uh, other treatments might be experimental, such as fecal transplant or other uh, live biotherapeutics that are being developed. Uh, and others might be uh, very expensive, such as monoclonal antibodies or the newer drug, fidaxomycin, which is now in the guidelines. Um, so for resource allocation, uh, that would be useful, but also for clinical trials, um, even with C. difficile um, being as prevalent as it is, the initial infection uh, is not very prevalent. In many hospitals, it's single-digit percentages of people that get it. And some of these outcomes of severity are fairly rare as well, single-digit percentages again. Very hard to do a clinical trial to know if uh, uh, things are effective when you have to um, have thousands of patients just to power your study adequately. But if you can enrich ahead of time for people who are more likely to have the outcome, then all of a sudden this trial becomes feasible that wasn't feasible before. With that, uh, I think I will end. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.